The kingdom of God is like a leaven, Jesus taught. A leaven, yeast, is hidden away in the larger mass until the whole is leavened, which means raised by its influence. Our Savior also taught that his followers will have tribulation in the world, that their numbers and dominions will be small, and that they will be hated because they are not of the world. But that is our role. We are called to live with other children of God who do not share our faith or our values and who do not have the covenant obligations we have assumed. So it was that at the conclusion of his ministry, Jesus prayed to the Father, not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. We are to be in the world, but not of the world. Since followers of Jesus Christ are commanded to be a leaven, not to be taken out of the world, but to remain in it, we must seek tolerance from those who hate us for not being of the world. As part of this, we will sometimes need to challenge laws that would impair our freedom to practice our faiths, doing so in reliance on our constitutional rights to the free exercise of religion. As described by an attorney supporting a Lutheran school in a case now before the United States Supreme Court, the big concern is, quote, the ability of people of all faiths to work out their relationship with God and one another without the government looking over their shoulder." End of quote. That is why we need understanding and support, including your understanding and support, when we must contend for religious freedom. We must also practice tolerance and respect toward others. As the Apostle Paul taught, Christians should follow after the things that make for peace, and as much as possible live peaceably with all men. Consequently, we should be alert to honor the good we should see in all people and in many opinions and practices that differ from our own. As the Book of Mormon teaches, all things which are good cometh of God, wherefore everything which inviteth and enticeth to do good and to love God and to serve him is inspired of God. Wherefore, take heed that ye do not judge that which is good to be of, and of God to be of the devil." End of quote. That approach to differences will yield tolerance and also respect. Our tolerance and respect for others and their beliefs does not cause us to abandon our commitment to the truths we understand and the covenants we have made. That is a third absolute truth. We do not abandon uh, the truth and our covenants. We are cast as combatants in the war between truth and error. There is no middle ground. We must stand up for truth even while we practice tolerance and respect for beliefs and ideas different from our own and for the people who hold them. While we must practice tolerance and respect for others and their beliefs, including their constitutional freedom to explain and advocate their positions, we are not required to respect and tolerate wrong behavior. Our duty to truth requires us to seek relief from some behavior that is wrong. This is easy to see when it involves extreme behaviors that most believers and non-believers recognize as wrong or unacceptable. For example, we must all deplore murder or other terrorist behavior even when done by extremists in the name of religion. And we must all oppose violence and thievery. As to less extreme behaviors, where even believers disagree on whether or not they are wrong, the nature and extent of what we should tolerate is much more difficult to define. Thus, a thoughtful LDS woman wrote me about her concern that, quote, 
the world's definition of tolerance seems to be increasingly used in relation to tolerating wicked lifestyles. She asked how the Lord would define tolerance. President Boyd K. Packer gave an inspired introduction to this subject. Speaking to an audience of Institute students three years ago, he said, the word tolerance does not stand alone. It requires an object and a response to qualify it as a virtue. Tolerance is often demanded, but seldom returned. Beware of the word tolerance. It is a very unstable virtue." End of quote. This inspired caution reminds us that for persons who believe in absolute truth, tolerance for behavior is like a two-sided coin. Tolerance, or respect, is on one side of the coin, but truth is always on the other. You cannot possess or use the coin of tolerance without being conscious of both sides. Our Savior applied this principle. When he faced the woman taken in adultery, Jesus spoke the comforting words of tolerance, neither do I condemn thee. Then as he sent her away, he spoke the commanding words of truth, go and sin no more. We should all be edified and strengthened by this example of speaking both tolerance and truth, kindness in the communication, but firmness in the truth. Let us consider how to apply that example to some other behaviors. Another thoughtful LDS member wrote, quote, In Messiah 18.9, Alma tells us that when we are baptized, we covenant to stand as witnesses of God at all times and in all things and in all places that ye may be in. What does this scripture mean for our day and how can it be applied by Latter-day Saints? Continuing the quote, Living in the mission field, I often hear the name of the Lord taken in vain. And I also have acquaintances who tell me they are living with their boyfriends. I have found that observance of the Sabbath is almost obsolete. How can I keep my covenant to stand as a witness and not offend these people?" End of quote. Profanity, cohabitation, and Sabbath breaking. Excellent examples to illustrate how Latter-day Saints might balance their competing duties to truth and tolerance in their own lives in these difficult circumstances. I begin with our personal conduct including the teaching of our children. In applying the sometimes competing demands of truth and tolerance in these three behaviors and many others, we should not be tolerant with ourselves. We should be ruled by the demands of truth. With ourselves, we should be strong in keeping the commandments and our covenants, and we should repent and improve when we fall short. As President Thomas S. Monson taught us in the conference where he was sustained as our prophet, my young friends, be strong. The face of sin today often wears the mask of tolerance. Do not be deceived. Behind that facade is heartache, unhappiness, and pain. You know what is right and what is wrong, and no disguise, however appealing, can change that. The character of transgression remains the same. If your so-called friends urge you to do anything you know to be wrong, you be the one to make a stand for right, even if you stand alone." End of quote. Similarly, with our children and others, we have a duty to teach, such as in our church callings. Our duty to truth is paramount. Of course, teaching efforts only bear fruit through the agency of others, so they must always be done with love, patience, and persuasion. I turn now to the obligations of truth and tolerance in our personal relations with associates who use profanity in our presence, who live with a partner out of wedlock, or who do not observe the Sabbath day appropriately. How should we react toward and communicate with them? Our obligation to tolerance means that none of these behaviors 
or others we consider deviations from the truth should ever cause us to react with hateful communications or unkind actions. But our obligation to truth has its own set of requirements and its own set of blessings. When we speak every man truth with his neighbor, and when we speak the truth in love, as the Apostle Paul taught, we are acting as servants of the Lord Jesus Christ, doing His work. Angels will stand with us, and He will send His Holy Spirit to guide us. In this sensitive matter, we should first consider whether, the, whether or the extent to which we should communicate to our associates what we know to be true about their behavior. In most cases, this decision can depend on how directly we are personally affected by it. Profanity, consistently used in our presence, is an appropriate cause for us to communicate the fact that this is offensive to us. Profanity used out of our presence by non-believers probably would not be an occasion for us to confront the offenders. Cohabitation we know to be a serious sin in which Latter-day Saints must not engage, whatever the circumstances. When practiced by those around us, it can be private behavior or something we are asked to condone, sponsor, or facilitate. In the balance between truth and tolerance, Tolerance can be dominant where the behavior does not involve us personally. If the cohabitation does involve us personally, we should be governed by our duty to truth. For example, it is one thing to ignore serious sins when they are private. It is quite another thing to be asked to sponsor or impliedly endorse them, such as by housing them in our own homes. On Sabbath observance, Latter-day Saints know that we are taught to observe the Sabbath day in a different way than many other Christians. Most of us are troubled by packed shopping centers and other commercial activities on the Sabbath. Perhaps we should explain our belief that our observance of the Sabbath, including our partaking of the sacrament, restores us spiritually and makes us better people for the rest of the week. Then, to other believers, we might express appreciation for the fact that we share common ground on what is most vital because each of us believes in God and in the existence of absolute truth, even though we differ in our definitions of these fundamentals. Beyond that, we should remember the Savior's teaching that we should avoid contention and that our example and our preaching should be the warning voice, every man to his neighbor, in mildness and in meekness. In all of this, we should not presume to judge our neighbors or associates on the ultimate effect of their behaviors. That judgment is the Lord's, not ours. Even he refrained from a final mortal judgment of the woman taken in adultery. Tolerance requires a similar refraining in our judgment of others.